appreciate all of those from Tri-City who are joining us. Of course, I appreciate all those from First Baptist who are here as well. Brother Comfort, when I was in college, he always used to say, man, when you're in evangelism, you're going to find that whenever there are visiting preachers in the service, it'll help the spirit of the meeting. He said, it won't do anything for the love offering, but it'll help the spirit of the meeting. Chapter 3 is where we're going to be tonight. What exciting times. People already out. Uh, you, know it's a, it, you know it's of God when people who aren't even members of the church take out church uh, door hangers and go and say, Pastor, don't worry about this street. I'm knocking it out. Yeah. I don't understand all of that. I mean, if you're going to get in, get in with uh, both feet and get in as deep as you can. But boy, we're thankful for the word to be gotten out. It humbles me that God can use Balaam's donkey. <laughs> Pastor, you ever notice how many people are giving their testimony of salvation and they say, I have no idea what the man preached the night I got saved. That's humbling to me. That tells me that if somebody gets saved, it's the power of God, yeah. not my power, or anybody else's power. But uh, we're here tonight, we're going to look into the scripture. Colossians chapter 3, I would direct your attention to verse 8. We've stood a lot this evening. If you're able to do so, I'd yet again, I would invite you to stand as we read from the Word of God. Colossians chapter 3, we'll begin our reading with verse 8. The Bible says, But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Why not one to another? Seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free. But Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. Any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Father, help us tonight as we look into the Scripture. I pray, Lord Jesus, that as you did to the men on the road to Emmaus, so you would open these Scriptures to us tonight. Father, cause us to understand, cause us to apply the Word of God. And Lord, speak to our hearts and use the Scriptures, we pray. Thank you for these that have come. We look for something from you to, to, tonight. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for standing. You may be seated. When I was in college, my parents had worked out a deal with me, at least in the beginning. And the deal was they would pay my room and board if I would pay for my tuition. It was a great scheme. In it, my dad was able to continue to claim me as an income tax exemption. He told mom, he said, you know, it's really cheaper to pay the college to feed him than it is for him to stay under our roof and for us to feed him. So that's the way they work. Well, I got a job working for the kitchen, the kitchen there at the school that I attended. And, uh, and I, after I applied, the man got uh, my class schedule. He said, okay, I can use you this time and this time and this time. And uh, so everything was good. And so I showed up. And it wasn't long before he discovered I had no culinary talent whatsoever. So now here I was working for this kitchen. He said, I don't know what we're going to do with this guy. And it wasn't long before I kind of just sort of filtered back to the area where we were washing the dishes. And I, that's kind of, that was kind of my niche. And in those days, there was a window, and they would bring the dirty dishes in, and uh, I would grab the dirty dishes, and I would spray them with a high-pressure hot water hose. I would then stack them on these special racks and put them in an industrial dishwasher. They'd come out on the other side where they would uh, dry, they would be dried, and then I would stack them, and that was my job. And so I, I was paid an hourly wage. Now, in those days, we referred to it as the dish pit. Now, the, the word pit is a little bit misleading because it was not a hole in the ground, but it was surrounded almost completely either by walls or by shelves that would hold the dishes. And so you felt a little bit claustrophobic as you were working in there. The average temperature was about 85 degrees year-round. The relative humidity hovered between 98 and 99 percent. It was just not a very pleasant atmosphere in which to work. And when I was working in there, they had, they had issued me a butcher's apron. It started about right here. It went all the way down past my knees. Ostensibly, Serge, it was to keep the water off of me while I was working. All right? That's not what it did. It acted as a giant downspout. 
valve and shot all the water straight into my shoes. And, uh, you know, I, but hey, it was a job. I was uh, able to do it. It didn't require a lot of brains. <laughs> it was kind of the job for me. And so, and man, the faster they would bring the dishes, the faster I'd work. Man, they'd, uh, they'd try to stack those dishes up, and I'd, I'd work through that stack of just, just one right after another, spraying every single one of them with that water hose, and, uh, you know, green beans would be flying up this way, and maybe corn and mashed potatoes would go this way, and boy, uh, I'd, uh, I'd get some in my hair, some in my shirt, and it was just it was just a job, and I would work like, like a wild man, and, uh, hey, it was paying the bills, so I worked at it, and I enjoyed what I was doing. But I found out some things. I found out in that kind of working environment, my deodorant was not all it was advertised to be. You know what I'm saying. I mean, it just, uh, I, I, I never did sue anybody for false advertising, but it wasn't what they had led me to believe, all right? Well, it happened about the beginning of the spring semester, about the late in the month of January, that something occurred on the Bible College campus where I attended. The ladies, the single ladies who lived in the dormitory developed a mental condition. Now, we gentlemen had no idea what it was. Whoa. We had never flipped, we had never flipped the calendar over and found that the month after January is February. We didn't know that. And that in the middle of the month of February is a Roman Catholic holiday. All right? Now, can I tell you, in an independent Baptist church, if you're a married man, please remember that Roman Catholic holiday. Okay? You say, but Brother Paul, I'm not Catholic. I know, but St. Valentine's Day is one you ought not forget. Well, the college made the girls' problem worse because they had it in their minds that maybe Mr. Wright was going to ask them and maybe they were going to finally get together and he would see the light and he would understand the way things really work in this world. That's what they were thinking round about the middle of January going into February. And, you know, it took us a while for the guys to get it. Round about February 12th, we thought, there's a big activity coming. What am I going to do? That's generally the way we dealt with it. But uh, in the middle of in the middle of that, they had this great big activity right around Valentine's Day. It was a nice banquet. I mean, the, the kind of banquet where you have where you have three or four forks. You ever been to that kind of a meal? I have two hands and one mouth, Serge. Why do I need four forks? I never can figure it out. But anyway, it was a fancy thing. I mean, they had things like ice sculptures. They had, uh, I remember one time, they uh, nominated me for the banqueting committee. That was an unqualified disaster. But I was on the banqueting committee, and these girls started talking about hanging tool from the ceiling. And I pictured a pipe wrench and a nip and that's not what they were talking about. I didn't know. I mean, I grew up in a construction worker's home. I had nothing but brothers. That's just all I knew. But they were making it a big to-do. And so the point was for single guys to invite single girls to go with them to this Valentine activity and everything would, uh, you know, it would begin, it would be the beginning of something and they'd live happily ever after eventually down the line. That was the idea. And so uh, I was interested in a girl. I talked to her dad over Thanksgiving and, and uh, he told me, he said, uh, Paul, I want you to kind of put the brakes on. You're just a freshman. She's just a freshman. Let's make sure we all get through school without too many distractions. I said, fine, I can handle that. Let's go play basketball. And uh, so for this Valentine activity, I volunteered to work. And so sure enough, uh, they had the big fancy meal. I didn't go to it, but uh, they had the big fancy meal. They're bringing all their dishes, you know, and I'm spraying like a wild man. I had gotten everything all tidied up. I was going around cleaning all the stainless steel surfaces. When I, I had my back to the window where they brought the dishes, when suddenly from that window, somebody called my name. I turned around. There, framed in the window, was the girl whose dad I had spoken to a few months before. There she was. A beautiful music. No, no, I didn't. Uh, but, uh, but there she was. She said, Paul, we've saved a seat for you at the concert. Now, we always had some kind of a music concert. This particular year, it was a string quartet. Now, Brother Lawrence, I had an idea what a string quartet was. I mean, you got a guy on a banjo, and you got a, a guy playing the double bass, and you got a couple of, you got a fiddle and maybe a guitar. That was a string quartet for me. We used to do that on Sunday nights at the Big Scoop Ice Cream in Taylor, South Carolina when I was a boy. But that's not what they had in mind. These were not fiddles. They were violins. And this was this uh, overgrown violin. No, no, no. It was a viola. And then this little baby double bass. No, that was a cello. And there is no H in the word cello. 
and they played music with German names, Ein Klein Nachtmusik. That was the concert. Well, folks, here was the, I, I looked at this girl. She said, I've saved a seat for you at the concert. I thought, I want to go. But my brain took hold before my mouth engaged. That doesn't always happen, but it did on this particular occasion. And I began to think. I looked at what I was wearing. I was wearing a pair of black jeans, and they were very, very wet below the knees. I was wearing a T-shirt, a maroon T-shirt. It was wet all up in here, and uh, I just, I didn't smell good. I didn't look good. I'd been working and washing dishes, and uh, and so I asked her. I said, "Okay, first of all, where is the seat that you've saved? And second of all, who is this we that you're talking about?" <laughs> She said, well, the seat that I've saved is the third row on the aisle. And she said, the we is uh, several people from the Emmanuel Baptist Church. We were all members of the Emmanuel Baptist Church. And so she said, the, the we is several people from the Emmanuel Baptist Church, including Dr. and Mrs. Brubaker. Now, you may not know the Brubakers. They're very nice people. The Lord has used them for many, many years as a music man traveling in evangelism. But uh, Mrs. Brubaker is not a snooty person, but she is a proper person. I don't know that she's ever burped at the table after she turned two. Okay? I mean, she's just a proper lady. I looked at what I was wearing, and I thought to myself, I would love to go and sit there, but I can't. And more than anything, I wanted to change my clothes because what I was wearing was inappropriate for what I wanted to do. Now, if you notice carefully in the book of Colossians chapter 3, you're going to see similar wording to what I just used. Notice in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 8, but now ye also put off all these. And then there's a list of things. As if it is, as if we have come in after working out in the lawn or the yard, and uh, we're working out, and we've uh, it's been hot, it's been sweaty, and now we need to get a shower because we're about to take our wife to a fancy restaurant for dinner. We we put off those old garments, and then in verse 12, you're going to see similar language. Notice he says, "Put on, therefore." So there's some things that I put off, and there's some things that I put on. I want, you to, I want you to notice what the Bible has to say here. We're going to look at this, what the Bible has, says in three ways. Notice, we're going to note, number one, our clothing. The Apostle Paul talks about our clothing. Notice in verse 8, he describes it negatively. He says, there's some things to put off. Put off anger, wrath, malice. Anger, wrath, and malice. I mean, that's the inability that, of people to get along one with another. Anger is that feeling of ill will that uh, seethes and boils on the inside. It causes a person to occasionally lash out with the tongue. But it's that, it's that inner feeling. Sometimes jealousy is a very close cousin to anger. And so the Bible says, if you're an angry person tonight, it's time to change your clothes because what you're wearing is inappropriate for a child of God. Then he talks about wrath. Wrath is when anger reaches a boiling point. It bubbles up and it blows up and it boils over. And that's what, that's what causes a lot of the violence that we see. Let me tell you something. If you're a person of wrath, unrestrained wrath, if, people, if you have a pride yourself in a short fuse, it's time to change your clothes tonight because what you're wearing is inappropriate for a child of God. Then he says malice. Malice is a little bit different altogether. Malice causes someone to put on a sweet smile in the vestibule, all the while plotting revenge in the heart. The Bible says if you're a malicious person, if you're the kind that's known for getting even, it's time to change your clothes tonight because what you're wearing is inappropriate for a child of God. He's talking about our clothing here. Notice he continues in verse 8. He says blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. When the Bible uses the word blasphemy, usually it's talking about blaspheming the name of our God. And we live in a, we live in a world today, a nation today, that blasphemy is so much a part of our culture that we have a text message abbreviation for blasphemy. We have a text message abbreviation for blasphemy, for taking the name of our God in vain. I want you to understand, thousands of years ago, the God of heaven shook the mountain and it, fled, it burned to such an extent that the children of Israel said, man, I'm afraid. Don't let God talk to me. Moses, you talk to us, but we're afraid of God. And one of the reasons they were afraid is the God of heaven thundered from the mountain and said, the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Yeah. Which, hey, that was true back on Mount Sinai. That's true today. 
today in 2015. But I believe when he's talking about blasphemy in Colossians chapter 3, he's not necessarily talking about blaspheming the name of God. The word blaspheme means to defame. It means to, it means to slander, and I believe we could use this synonym here in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 8. We could use the word gossip. Gossip. You know, the truth is there, there are many of you that would consider it scandalous if we walked out and, uh, and you cussed a blue streak before getting into your car to drive home tonight. Yeah. You wouldn't consider using that, but some of us in here have a tongue so sharp we can pick a peanut out of a Coke bottle and not touch either rim, and you and I can be known for slandering other people. I want you to know, the Apostle Paul is saying, if you have a defaming and blaspheming tongue, if there is blasphemy in your mouth, defaming of others, defaming of God might certainly be included. But if that is if that characterizes you, if that characterizes me, it's time to change our clothes tonight because what we're wearing is inappropriate for a child of God. He goes on. He says, blasphemy then filthy communication out of your mouth. You know, God wants you and me to use speech that ministers grace to the hearers. What is grace? When I came to the cross of Calvary and I brought my sin to the Lord Jesus, He looked at me and gave me something far better than I deserve. He erased my sin in His own precious blood. He made me as righteous as God is. He gave me a home in heaven. He gave me the indwelling Holy Spirit to give me the power to live the Christian life. I'm telling you, when I came to the cross of Calvary, I received the grace of God far better than I ever deserved. Yeah. And now that I'm saved, God says the words that I speak are to treat others better than they deserve. Yeah. If I'm a person who characterized by filthy communication out of my mouth, it's time to change my clothes. What I'm wearing is inappropriate for a child of God. He goes on in verse 9, he says, Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. Positionally, I have put off the old man. Practically, it's time to make my practice match my position. That's what he's saying. The Bible says in verse 10, we put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. Thank God there are no ethnic bounds of the gospel. There are no national bounds of the gospel. There are no economic bounds of the gospel. There are no educational bounds of the gospel. Christ makes us one in Him when we place our trust in His work on Calvary. Thank God for that. Now notice what He says. He's describing our clothing still in verse 12. We're to put some things off, verse 8 tells us. And verse 12 tells us we're to put some things off. Now notice what He says. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved. Here's what I'm to put on. Bowels of mercies. Now, we don't use terminology like that on a regular basis today. In the Word of God, however, the term bowels of mercies refers to mercy that comes from the innermost part of our being. For Valentine's Day, none of you married men go out and get your wife a card made by Hallmark or American Greetings or somebody else that says, I love you with all my liver. <laughs> you just don't say that, okay? That's a little bit weird for the way we think and the way we talk. We don't, we don't approach it that way. But in the Word of God, they, they described it using similar language. Now, we do talk about butterflies in the pit of our stomach. Some of you dear folks came over here from another country. I can't even imagine trying to figure out that English idiot. Butterflies in the... What? Butterflies in the pit of your stomach? What is that all about? We do talk about gut feelings, don't we? Now, why do we use that terminology? Well, that is true, referring to the fact that sometimes those deep feelings seem to emanate from the deepest part of our body. And so the Bible says, what ought to emanate from your innermost being and from my innermost being is mercy. Amen. I'm going to tell you, I'm an independent Baptist. I don't ever plan to be anything else. Amen. But may God help us, sometimes we're a little short on mercy. Yeah. Sometimes we're a little short on mercy. You know what the Bible says? He has showed the old man what is good. And what doth the Lord thy God require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy? If we're not careful, we can get that mixed up. We can love justice and occasionally do a little mercy. But the Bible says we're to do justly. You want to worry about doing right? You make sure that you're doing right before God. And then when it comes to the way others are responding, you learn to love mercy. I want you to understand, if you're not a merciful person,
person this evening, it's time to change your clothes. What you're wearing is inappropriate for a child of God. He goes on. He says this. He says, not only bowels of mercies, but kindness. I don't know when it happened, but somewhere along the line, we got convinced as a culture that being unkind to others was cool. We got convinced that that was the end thing to do. But the Bible says you and I ought to be kind to others. I don't care how they treat you. You and I ought to be kind. The Bible says bowels of mercy is kindness. And he says humbleness of mind. Humbleness of mind. That means that sometimes people aren't going to agree with me. And if it's a, if it's a non-essential issue, that's going to be okay. And somebody comes to me and says, well, you know, Brother Paul, I don't believe Jesus really was God. I think the Pharisees just misunderstood it. Well, then we're going to go some rounds about that, okay? And we're going to, we're going to, uh, we're going to de just debate that and discuss that very heatedly. And if at the end we can't agree, then we're going to part ways. But you know what? So many times what we disagree on really isn't that important. And yet people say, well, it's got to be my way or I'm going to take my tithe and go home. But you know what the Bible says? That we ought to be characterized by humbleness of mind. The notice the Bible says meekness. Somebody defined meekness in this way. He said meekness is realizing that there's one God and you ain't Him. Amen. That's pretty good, isn't it? Meekness is not weakness, but it is the ability to be treated less than my rank or position deserves. Well, we got people that are doing the opposite of that today, don't we? Well, this is my right. I am entitled to this. Because my great, 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 great granddaddy went through some difficult times when he first came to this country. Therefore, I am entitled to this. Listen, I don't want to take anything away from your ancestors or mine. But the truth of the matter is, I am entitled to a death in the lake of fire. And when Jesus Christ gave me a home in heaven, he gave me better than I deserve. And thank God that what I'm getting is better than I deserve. Therefore, I have no right to go around and expect people to treat me as if I'm the big cheese. That's what meekness is all about. Notice he says, he's describing our clothing positively. He says, put on bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering. <laughs> kind of defines itself, doesn't it? You haven't lived very long if you don't realize that there are people in this world that are going to make you suffer. I mean, let's face it, all of us are weird. <laughs> Every one of y'all out there is weird. Well, I include myself, I'm weird too. Every one of us has quirks. And sometimes those quirky things get on each other's nerves. Do you know that if you were to go out to a restaurant with me and they were to bring me a little thing, container of butter, one of those cylindrical things of butter, I would cut it exactly in half? Now, Dominic, why do I need to cut it in half? I don't know, but I do. And I have to get every bit out of the one side and put it on half the roll, and every bit on the other side and put it on the other half of the roll. Weird! Weird! And yet that's the way we are. We all have those kinds of things. And when you and I uh, come together in any kind of human relationship, it's only a matter of time before those quirks and those idiosyncrasies will begin to greet one upon another. And yet the Bible says, as you and I are putting off the old man and we're putting on the new man, it is important that one of the things we put on is long-suffering. Notice what he says in verse 13. He says, forbearing one another. That word forbearing one another simply means putting up with. You know, most of the things people squabble about and most of the things people get upset about are usually very small trifling matters. Pastor Gritton, I know of a church in a distant state that nearly split over how to clean the carpets in the auditorium. They nearly split another time over what kind of, of a vacation Bible school curriculum to use. Do you understand... As long as the carpets are clean, who cares? I mean, if you got to bring the nursery kids in there and they vacuum it with a straw, as long as the carpets are clean, right? But the Bible says if you're a person that grabs and latches hold of things and things really bother you, it's time to change your clothes tonight because what you're wearing is inappropriate for a child of God. And the Bible says that we are to be forbearing one another. And then I want you to notice these next words. We're in verse 13 now. The Bible says forbearing one another and forgiving one another. Please understand this. Forgiveness 
is very much a different level than forbearance. The more I minister in the United States of America, the more I preach to people, Brother Dwayne, that are victims of gross abuse. A few years back, I preached for a pastor that had been the victim of abuse. And he told me, he said, Brother Paul, it's impossible to forget the things that were said to me. It's impossible to forget the things that were done to me. And yet, it may be impossible to forget. It may be impossible to get those out of your mind and out of your memory. But thank God you can still forgive. You can still release it through the power of Jesus Christ. And I want you to understand, if you're here this evening and you have a bitter, angry, unforgiving spirit, it's time to change your clothes tonight because what you're wearing is inappropriate for a child of God. He says, put off those things and put on some new things. And so the Apostle Paul describes our clothing here in the passage of Scripture. I want you to notice another phrase in verse 13. He says, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. Notice this phrase. If any man have a quarrel against any. Do you see that? If any man have a quarrel against any. That's an interesting phrase. That's like saying if the sun comes up tomorrow. <laughs> hey. Clouds may roll in, wherever clouds roll in from in South Florida. I guess they roll in from all sides probably. Wherever they roll in from, clouds may roll in, and I may not see the sun, but the sun's coming up tomorrow. I may die in the night, but the sun's coming up tomorrow. Hey, we all may be raptured out of here, but the sun's coming up tomorrow, and hear it, you and I will have a quarrel with other people. It's inevitable. Jesus noted in Luke chapter 17, it is impossible, but that offenses will come. Fasten your seatbelt. Hang on to your hat. There's going to come a time when there will be difficulties getting along one person with another. The Apostle Paul has talked about our clothing, but number two, in this phrase, he highlights our conflict. He highlights the fact that there will be conflict as we endeavor to live with each other. And I want you to understand this about the conflict. The conflict reveals our clothing. The conflict reveals our clothing spiritually. Now, you look up to verse 12 and notice what the Bible says here, all right? He says we're to put on some things. The first thing we're to put on is bowels of mercies. Now, follow me, please. There is no need for mercy until someone has committed a wrong, right? But the very definition of mercy is someone has committed a wrong and mercy says, I, I have the right to punish them for that wrong, but I do not exercise that right. That's what mercy is. And so I can't tell if I'm a person of bowels of mercies until there's some kind of a conflict. Notice he goes on. The conflict reveals our clothing. Verse 12. He says kindness. Listen, if I'm kind to people who are kind to me, there's no difference between me and an unsafe person. Unsafe people do that all the time. But when there's someone that is unkind to me and I respond to them in kindness, all of a sudden there is it's shown to be a difference between the unsaved man and the saint. And the conflict reveals our clothing. He goes on. He talks about humbleness of mind. If everybody agrees with me all the time, Bernie, if everybody looks at me and says, Oh, Brother Paul, that's the best way to do it. You do it. That's a good. If everybody agrees with me all the time, there's no need for humbleness of mind. I can't tell if I'm a person of humbleness of mind or not. But when people disagree with me, then the conflict reveals my clothing spiritually. Look up further. He says, meekness. Hey, if everybody treats me like the, like the, the grand poobah and the big cheese, and uh, they treat me like I'm somebody special, then there, there's no need for meekness. But you let someone come in and treat me less than I believe I deserve to be treated, all of a sudden the conflict reveals my spiritual clothing. The same can be true of long-suffering. The same can be true of forbearance. The same can be true of forgiveness. Understand, when the conflict comes in your life and in mine, it reveals what we are all about spiritually. I grew up in a Christian college town. And one of the realities of a Christian college town was I rubbed the shoulders of a lot of Christian college students. One of the things they had to offer, they had roommate stories. I shared the most bizarre roommate stories. I mean, it, it did, I, I would hear these things and I would think to myself, wow, there are really people in this world that do that kind of thing? And the short answer is, yeah, there really are. I would hear these stories and I would think to myself, well, I, I, would, I would hear about carnality in Christian colleges. And I would think to myself, I know why they're so carnal. They're so carnal.
them because they probably grew up to great privileges. They probably lived in a home where they had their own bedroom all of their life. And they never found out what it was like to live with two younger fathers. I, I, I mean brothers. I mean, I had to share the same room with them. Now, there are some young people here tonight that are going to scoff at what I just said because they share a room with uh, six brothers or, you know, however many it may be. But the truth of the matter is, uh, I, I had to share this room and I thought, you know, I'm not going to have problems with roommates. I have learned to get along with these people with all of their idiosyncrasies. I've been able to handle this. It's not going to be a problem for me when I go to college. Then I went to college. And I had some interesting roommates. <coughs> One roommate, they called him Hog. <laughs> Not everybody called him that, but there were some people that called him Hog. I never did figure out why. Some said it's because he gained 40 pounds his freshman year. The food was good, I'll grant you that. Uh, other people said it's because of the way he kept his room. I don't know. Some people called him Hog Boy. He was one of my roommates. Then I had this. The, there was another roommate I had, and really, I was very thankful for him. He was a great guy, but he wasn't even from the United States of America. At least not what we think of as the United States. He was from the Federated States of Micronesia. He grew up on an island in the Pacific Ocean, and now he had come to North Carolina, and he was my roommate. But you know what? He was a great guy. He talked about chopping wood. He said, I'm not going to marry a woman unless she can really chop wood. <laughs> never figured out how that worked out for him, but that's what he used to say when he was in college. And uh, the weirdest thing he did, he would lock his arms and make a jump rope out of him and jump back and forth. But I can handle that. That's not a problem. It was the other guy. It was the other guy, though, that God used to teach me a lesson. Now, I'm not going to look at anybody when I say this, okay? He was really short. <laughs> I'm not looking at anybody, okay? but he was really short. And, uh, and he had some habits that kind of annoyed me. For one thing, he had the, the habit of interrupting people when, when we would talk. Now, I grew up in a home where I was taught that's rude. Now, the person may be blathering and filling the air with nonsense, but give them enough rope, they'll hang themselves. Don't interrupt them when they talk. That's just kind of that's just kind of the way I was brought up. I'm even a little I'm not real comfortable with talk radio because they maybe a communist calling in, but they interrupt them, you know. And I understand their time restraints and all that, but it, it, that's just me. But this guy interrupted me, and he interrupted everybody. One day somebody came to me and they asked me a question. I don't remember the question, but I remember it was very involved in regard to the Second World War. They said, "Well, I understand you've done some study on the Second World War." I said, uh, <clears throat> "Well." As a matter of fact, uh, I have a little bit of uh, research in that area. As a matter of fact, when I was eight years of age, I began my study of the subject, and uh, I do not know everything that there is to know, but I feel that I may be able to answer your question. What is your question? And I said, well, uh, I, I think it was something like, why did Germany invade Poland in 1939? I mean, it was, this was pretty bold. I looked at him, Brother Smith, and I said, well, I said, are you certain that you have the time necessary for me to give you the feelings? And the guy said, well, I guess so. I just kind of wanted to know. And so I began to delve into the verities of early 20th century history. We spoke of the Treaty of Versailles. We talked of the League of Nations. We, talk, we spoke of the Weimar Republic and how inflation was rampant in the late 1920s. We spoke of Paul von Hindenburg, the World War I hero who lay on his deathbed in 1932, and how that in 1932 an election was held. Nobody won a majority, but one guy got more votes than anybody else, a fellow by the name of Adolf Hitler. And then we talked and talked and talked, and folks, I was sitting there in the dormitory just blathering. I mean, I was waxing elephants, if you know what I mean, okay? Just going on and on and on. And uh, into this conversation comes my little roommate. And I don't think he knew anything about the Second World War, except maybe the United States was involved in a battle or two. He came in, and he interrupted me. And he had a voice of which he might have been done. If I'd have known, I'd have recorded it, and I would have competed with this Duck Dynasty crowd, and I'd have been richer than they are. And just kind of quacked at you. I looked at him, and I could feel 
the frustration rising within me. Are you listening? The conflict was revealing my clothing, and what it was showing about me was not good. But I didn't see it. My roommate had some other problems. He would set his alarm every day for 5.30 a.m. Now, in those days, I would get up every morning at 5 a.m. Unless I had to go to work and work the breakfast shift, and then I got up at 3.30 a.m. You say, Brother Paul, you must have been really spiritual. No, I was really tired those days, okay? But that's, I would get up normal days, 5.30. I used a little Timex wristwatch to wake me up. Many were the days I would awaken at 4.59 and shut off my alarm so as not to disturb my roommates. Now, that didn't happen every morning, but many mornings it did. Now, I'd be reading about some, some from the book of Second Chronicles asking God to speak to my heart, when around right about 5.30 it would start in. I was required by the laws of the, the laws, 
rules, the, the rules, whatever you call them, rules of the school. I was required by the rules to be back in my dorm room at 9.45 in those days. I would risk being late and getting to merits just so I didn't have to spend time with The conflict was revealing something about me, but I still didn't see. One day, a boy came to me. He looked at me and said, Paul, he said, you need to get right with that other roommate because your attitude toward him stinks. I didn't necessarily want to hear that, but that young man helped me that day. You know, I went to him, and I apologized to him. I said, I want you to know that my attitude toward you has not been right, and I want you to know that I have been wrong, and I'm going to ask you to forgive me right here. You know what he did? And when he forgave me, the entire atmosphere of our dorm room changed. Now, wait a minute. He still interrupted me when I talked. Okay. He still set his alarm for 5.30 and never got out of bed till much, much later. By that time, he had gotten it through his head that uh, Sarah was probably a little more interested in me than she was in him. But other than that, nothing changed in our dorm room, and yet it was like it was a whole different place. Do you understand as I preach along these lines in different places, some people come to me after a service and they say, well, Brother Paul, you don't understand. He is 59% wrong, or he is 95% wrong. And although I've not been perfect, I'm only 2 or 3 or 5% wrong. Can I tell you something? Don't get involved in those percentages tonight. You can't control the other person's response. But before God, you can get your whole heart right with Him. And before God, you can say, Holy Spirit, would you clothe me? Me and the behavior and the attitudes of Jesus Christ and would you make me Christ-like and the way I deal with others you can do you can solve it for yourself tonight and yet so many people go on with, with conflict that goes and goes and eats away at us from the inside because they want to get involved in he's this much percent wrong but I'm not that much of a percent at Brett Paul I want you to understand you just deal with the problem in you and see what God does entire atmosphere of our dorm changed. My roommate was still the same old guy. But it was so different because I changed my clothes. The Apostle Paul tells us three things. He mentions our clothing. He talks about our conflict. I want you to notice one final emphasis that he gives. The Bible says in verse 13, if any man have a quarrel against any, notice this, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. I want you to understand, he draws our attention back to the captain of our salvation, our captain, Jesus Christ. He's got our clothing, he's got the conflict, and then he talks about the captain. Because understand something, when you try to deal with other people, and you, <clears throat> you try to treat them in a right way, you will not be able to do so in the power of your flesh. You don't have the self-discipline. You don't have the. You, you, you just don't have what it takes. It's going to take you depending upon the life of Jesus Christ and the God of heaven working through your members and empowering them as instruments of righteousness unto God in order for you to forgive. If you're a victim of abuse tonight, you're not going to be able to forgive apart from the power of God. No wonder the Apostle Paul says, even as Christ, you want to know how to forgive. You look to Calvary. You look to Jesus. You look to the captain of our salvation. The Bible talks about our, sin, our Savior, the Son of God. You're going to find that the Lord Jesus was the perfect example of everything the Scripture tells us to be. You want to talk about vows of mercies? We can go over to John chapter 8. And by the way, I still believe John chapter 8 ought to be in the Bible. I still believe it's just right the way it is. I still believe God has miraculously preserved it for us. And I don't believe that the oldest and best manuscripts are any... Or, or, I don't believe that, uh, that they're oldest and best anyway. But even if they were, there's no reason to take it out of our Bible. Because in John chapter 8, we find a woman taken in adultery in the very act. Scribes and Pharisees brought her to the Lord Jesus. They said, all right, Lord Jesus, Moses said she should be stoned. But what says that? You know what the answer is? Not a thing. The Bible says Jesus stooped down, and the Bible says Jesus wrote in the dirt as though he heard them not. And by the time he was done writing, every one of those accusers had gone their way in an orderly fashion according to their age. And Jesus looked up and he looked around and he said, Woman, where are these thine accusers? Doth no man condemn?
condemn me? And she said, no man. He said, then neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. I'm here to report to you tonight that when you and I have trouble by ex extending mercy to those who have wronged us, we need only to run to the feet of the Savior. The Bible talks about kindness. A woman with the issue of blood interrupted his schedule as he was on his way to go to the house of Tyrus. She said, if I may but touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. The Bible says she was working her way through the crowd. The Bible calls it the press at times. And so here she was working her way. The Bible says she gets up close to the Son of God. And she, and she touches the hem of his garment and sure enough, immediately she's made whole. Jesus stopped. He looked around. He said, who touched me? Peter didn't want to say anything stupid, but uh, he said, uh, Lord, the multitudes throng thee and says thou who touched me? Uh, could have been anybody, Lord. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying. Jesus said, no, no. He said, somebody had touched me. The Bible says Jesus perceived that virtue had gone out of him. And the woman realizes, I've been found out. I've interrupted the schedule of the Savior. He's on his way to go and, uh, and heal a little girl who's at the point of death. How will Jesus respond? Well, he will respond in kindness just as you and I are to respond. The Bible says, Thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. And so she did. We want to talk about the humbleness of mind. We find in Philippians 2 and verse 7 that Jesus, being in the form of God, thought it not proper to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. We want to talk about meekness. We find a Savior uh, only hours from the greatest agony, the greatest suffering that humankind would ever know. And yet, Yet, knowing that he that he was going to the cross of Calvary, he laid aside his garments, he took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wipe the and wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. He said, You should do this to others as I have done to you. What was he giving us? An example of meekness. Peter understood it. He said, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? This is the king, the promised Messiah. Lord, you have no business washing my feet. Oh, what an example of meekness from the captain of our salvation. We want to go on. We can go into and look at long suffering. Many were the times that Jesus looked around and said, Oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? And yet he did suffer them. Thank God he's still patient with me. Thank God he's still patient with you tonight. And whenever you and I get all worked up and all upset, it, it behooves us to run to the captain of our salvation. And the Bible talks about forbearance and forgiveness. I want you to understand when Jesus Christ was being nailed to the cross of Calvary, it could have been more than one time that he said the words, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. It could be that that was a phrase repeated often throughout the process. So that as a Roman hammer came down on a, on a spike to drive through his left hand, he could have said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. As it came down through his holy feet that went about doing good, he could have said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. As they spit in his face, he could have responded by saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And I want you to understand, when you and I find the temptation to harbor bitterness in our heart and to treat people in a less than Christ-like manner, run to the captain of our salvation. As Christ gave you, so also do ye. Some years went by in my college experience, and I was no longer working in the kitchen. <clears throat> I was now teaching piano to make my way through college. I'd been out in the state of Illinois, and in the state of Illinois, they, we were I was traveling with a group from the school. We were they were having some kind of a sale at a formal wear shop. And as I walked by, I noticed they had some tuxedos on sale for $10. I don't know a whole lot about tuxedos. But I don't think you can rent one for $10. Maybe you can. I don't know. But this one was on sale for $10. Now, granted, I would have never been caught dead in this one, Brother Manny. It was electric blue with sequins on <laughs> They had a red one to match. $10. Yeah, you know, that's just not me. But who knows if they got this one, maybe they'll have another one. So I went back, and I was, I was looking, and sure enough, they had one. And, uh, and, and it, it, it looked good. It was more 
my style, you know. And uh, so I got it. I got it off the shelf, and I looked at it. And thought, wow. Now it was for twenty-five dollars, but again, I thought I don't think you could rent one for twenty-five dollars. That looks to be a good deal. But then I thought that I thought nobody that they don't mass produce clothes in this size. Okay, they just don't. I was in Port Charlotte today at a mall trying to replace a pair of pants that I think was 11 or 12 or 13 years old. I don't know how old it was. But uh, I think we found maybe three or four pairs of pa uh, dress pants in my size in the entire store. They don't mass produce clothes like this. These fit an eight, but they don't fit normal humanity, okay? So I knew the coat wasn't going to be in my size. I, I just knew it. I don't know. Hey, what can it hurt? I'll try it on anyway. I put it on. <laughs> it fit. And it fit beautifully. And I thought, you know, I'm just going to go ahead and buy this thing. So I did. I wadded it up and stuffed it in a bag because I didn't want anybody to know that I was planning ahead for the Valentine activity that was still a calendar year away. But I sneaked it home and then all the way through the fall semester, I didn't do anything with it. The spring semester came, and by this time, uh, Sarah's dad had said that we were allowed to do things together. We were allowed to go on dates and start recording or whatever you want to call it. And so, and so I thought, hey, this Valentine activity, I'm not working in the kitchen now. I can take this girl to this activity. And so that's what we're going to do. Going to be a fancy meal. Going to be a pianist uh, doing a musical concert afterwards. And uh, so I thought, man, this is the time. We're going to have a good time tonight. So sure enough, got, I got home and uh, I, I, I showered, got changed and all that, and I pulled this thing out of the closet. And it looked good. I put it on, and it looked even better. <laughs> and so I went out of the, I went out of the, I went down the stairs of the dormitory there, and as I was walking down, the rabbits and squirrels of Western North Carolina stopped in mid <laughs> I don't know they could do that, but uh, I got there, and it, I, I got there. We went to, we went to the fancy banquet. My, uh, the girl is now my wife. We were, we were sitting together. We laughing, having a good time, went off to the, went off to the piano concert, and the, the pianist played and, uh, for, I don't know, an hour or so, and the book. it was just really enjoyable, I enjoyed the whole thing, well, I got home at the end of the day, I was hanging up the tuxedo in the, in the closet, and I got to thinking back to the first time, the first activity, when I was a freshman, the one I told you about the first, uh, the message, and I got to thinking, you know, there were a lot of similarities about those two things, I was interested in the same girl, okay, that's my first girlfriend right there. Amen. Yeah. All right. And uh, I was interested in the same girl. And she obviously, after she met me, was interested in no one else. <laughs> but uh, but she, we, we were interested. That hadn't changed. The kind of meal. I mean, it, the, the menu, I'm sure, was a little bit different in the, in the years. But it was the same similar type of meal. It was very fancy. It was very uh, very, uh, very polished type of event. And, uh, and then there was a musical concert. Now, it was slightly different, but essentially the same. Everything was the same about the two stories except one thing. My clothes. And you know, when I changed my clothes, that had made all of the difference. Can I tell you, as you endeavor to deal with other people in this life, if you'll change your clothes spiritually, it'll make all the difference. Yeah. We find from the book of Colossians chapter 3 that you must be Christ-like in your interpersonal relationships. Every head is bowed, please. Every eye is closed. Lord Jesus, we're so grateful for the Word of God. We're so grateful for its practicality. And now, my Father, I pray that you do a great work in this time of invitation. How many here tonight would say, Brother Paul, if I were to die right now,